The goal of the Nourishing Connection program is to nourish the connections children have with healthy produce, gardens, and farms by providing hands-on agricultural and nutrition education experiences through hanging and on-site gardens, teacher training with access to farm to early childhood education curricula, and conducting educational outreach to parents and educators in preschool. We hope as the program continues to grow that we can also provide locally grown foods to your child care lunch programs. In this video, you will learn how to take care of your hanging gardens, how to use them in your daily routines and curriculum resources to help you have a thriving farm to early child care program at your center. Hi, my name is Samantha Goyret. I'm the executive director of the Northwest Tennessee Local Food Network. We're a nonprofit organization here based out of Martin. And our mission is to catalyze actions to increase access to locally grown foods. We are so glad you're with us today and taking the time out of your busy schedules to have this training opportunity. And we hope today that you are inspired and motivated to take on these growing programs, the Nourishing Connection program with your children. And hopefully the children will also be motivated and inspired by your activities that we have provided for you. Today we have Bethany Walters. She is an assistant professor of uh, horticulture at the University of Tennessee at Martin, uh, plant and soil sciences as well. And today she's gonna share with us some tips about how to transplant plants. We've laid out all the plants where we think we want them to go. And we've made sure every plant has enough space. I wanna show you how to transplant this kale plant. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is this is, so one of the things you can do is just kind of gently squeeze the pot. This makes sure all the soil and roots are loose. And then you just flip it over and it should come out. It's called a transplant and basically it's like a, it's, it's equivalent of a preschool age plant. So it's growing, it's starting to grow, but it is pretty young and so you want to be careful when you take it out of its container. The roots will be in here and they'll be really fragile, so be gentle. Next, you'll dig a hole where you want your transplant to go, about the same size as the pot. And then, um, some of the soil may fall out, and that's okay, because there's extra soil in here. The roots only go about this far. but. You'll just gently place it in there. Gently firm the soil around the plant. And your goal is for the soil in the pot to be at the same level as the soil in your garden. So just try and put the plant as deep as it was in your pot. get a little beat up they will usually recover and and start to grow especially if you take good care of them and give them a little bit of water and the last thing you want to do is put a, a marker next to the plant with all the information you need so the plant name in case you don't remember what that plant is in like two months and maybe whoever's plant, if, if, if the plant belongs to a child, you can put their name on it so they know that that's their plant. Reading seed packets. My name is Bethany Walters and I am going to give you some tips and tricks to make you look like you are a gardening pro. So the seed packets might look uh, confusing. Uh, they have pretty pictures and then you flip them over and all of a sudden there's all this information. But if you learn how to read seed packets, they are like a little mini gardening cheat sheet full of useful information. What is tricky is that um, different company seed packets look slightly different and you might see different types of information in different places on each type of seed. But by the end of this video, you will know what information you can find on seed packets, where to find it, and what to do with it. So we're gonna talk about 
the species and cultivar, planting dates, planting depth and spacing, the size of seeds, days to germination and harvest, and then growing conditions. The front of the seed is probably the easiest and most enjoyable part to look at because it includes uh, pictures. On the front, in addition to the picture, you're also going to see the species name. Um, species refers to the type of plant. So for example, cucumbers, lettuce, tomato, those would all be the species. You'll also see cultivar or variety names because we have more than one type of tomato. And so this is the Rudgers cultivar of the tomato. Here we have the green dragon burpless cucumbers. If you have a favorite cultivar or variety, then you can find that one. If not, there's a lot of good choices out there and through some experimentation, you can find some ones that you enjoy growing. Now let's flip the seed packet over and one thing you will see on the back usually is the plant description. This is a um, paragraph or a few sentences that gives descriptions of things like plant appearance, size, flavor, unique traits or features like uh, leaf color, disease resistance. Um, it may also include gardening information. So for example, on this cucumber seed packet, we have this little gardening tip. So reading the seed description can give you a lot of good information. Next, you'll need to find the planting date. And this can be confusing because you might have more than one date. You might see a direct seeding or a plant outdoors seeding date. And you also may see a start indoors or indirect seeding date. Direct seeding means you put the seeds in the ground outside and they grow in the ground. Starting indoors means you start plants um, in a small pot um, inside for a few weeks and then um, when they're bigger then you transplant them out into the garden. You can do either one. Generally, the start indoor date will be earlier than the start outdoors date. And you might either see a calendar date or weeks before or after frost. So on this seed packet here, we have a map of the United States and um, each area is color coded for what months of the year you can start planting. On this seed packet, it just says that you can start out, um, start indoors three to four weeks before the last frost. And then you can plant outdoors after the last frost has passed. So if you're wondering how you know when the last frost is, here's a good rule of thumb. April 15th is the average date of the last frost in Western Tennessee. Now this is an average, so this is not a guarantee. Um, if you want to be really sure that you won't have any frosts, you can wait a few weeks till the end of April or beginning of May. But generally, April 15th is the date when you can put seeds and plants outdoors and they may not be killed by frosts. On the seed packet, you will find information on planting depth. Depth is really important. And this is one of the things you should follow exactly according to the directions. Some of these other things, if you, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but depth is not one of them. So on the packet, it will show you what the depth is. For cucumbers, it's half an inch. For this um, lettuce, it's a fourth of an inch. When you know what the depth is, you can use um, a, a trowel or um, a pencil or your finger to uh, make small holes or maybe a narrow trench in the soil that depth where you'll plant the seeds. Next to planting depth, you will see plant spacing and there might be two different types of spacing. You will almost always see seed spacing. And this is how far apart you should put the seeds when you plant them. Because 
we know that each individual plant needs enough space for its leaves and its roots. So for this tomato plant, it says uh, an eighth of an inch. Nope, half an inch, half an inch. So that's how far apart you should put each seed. This one also has additional information like um, how far each row of tomatoes should be if you are growing more than one row. You might also have um, a category that says space after thinning. And the space after thinning is three inches. Now that's much bigger than half an inch. What happens is you, it's a good idea to plant a few extra seeds just in case one or two of them don't come up. And you will often end up with more than one seed per area or per pot. And when they're about this big, you can go in and, and choose the best one and gently pull out the rest of them. And this is called thinning. So you would put seeds out um, um, half an inch apart after a week or two, pick the best one within that three inch section and remove all the rest. You may not see this um, space for thinning on certain seeds because it may not be as relevant. You will be told the days it takes for germination. This means how many days between the day you plant the seed in the ground and um, it starts to um, germinate, grow, and emerge up out of the soil. This is good to know because some seeds take a little bit of time. This lettuce seed, for example, takes 7 to 14 days. And if you knew that, then after 5 days you wouldn't get really impatient and concerned because you knew you just needed to wait a few more days. If you've passed that germination period and you don't see any seeds that have germinated, it means probably there was something wrong and you can try again. You might also see days to maturity, and this tells you how many days from when you start the seeds in the ground to when the plant is full size or you can harvest it. So lettuce is pretty quick. It only takes a minimum of 40 days. There is a lot of other useful information you might find on seed packets. For example, it might tell you how big the plant is at maturity. So do you have space for a six foot tall sunflower or would you prefer one that's like two feet tall? It may tell you whether or not this plant wants um, full sun or shade. Sometimes it'll give you um, tips on watering and nutrients. And so one of my tips for you is to save your seed packets somewhere so you can go back and refer to them if you need. Or maybe take a picture of them so that you don't have to keep track of that uh, paper package. Now not all the information we went over in this video will be on all the seed packets, but you should be able to find um, most of this information. And if there's something else you want to know that you're not told on the seed packet, you can always do a little bit of research on the internet or in books because um, things for growing cucumbers typically apply to all cucumber types, for example. What do your plants need to grow? My name is Bethany Walters and I'm a professor at the University of Tennessee at Martin in plant science. And I am gonna to talk to you a little bit about the five things you need to provide to your plants to make sure that they are happy, healthy, and growing. So to survive and grow, plants need light, water, space, air, and nutrients. And your um, your uh, gardens that are part of the Nourishing Connections are set up in a way to help you provide all these things to your plants. So let's start with light. We know that plants need light. Sunlight serves as the energy source that powers plants. They take energy from the sun and turn it into um, sugars through photosynthesis. So always make sure your plants have access to light. Now different plants have different preferred light levels and this ranges from full sun like we see in this um, garden here where there's uh, no shade uh, from trees or buildings covering the plants to um, full shade which is what you see here in the front of this picture where um, the large trees are providing a lot of shade for the plants underneath 
And then you can also have partial shade when, when there's some shade either uh, at certain types of day. So all plants have different preferences in terms of what they want. Almost all fruit and vegetable plants like full sun. Plants need water to survive. And with water, it's key to not give them too much and not give them too little. So if you've given plants too much water, you might see standing water on the soil or in your pots. If you've given them too little, you'll see signs like uh, we see in this pepper plant where the plants are wilted. Um, and when you provide water, you want to try and make sure the water will reach the roots. So the plant roots are where um, plants get water. So when, if you were, uh, here's a corn plant and you can see the roots extend down um, up to a foot um, and they could probably grow further and they branch out a little bit away from the stem. And so you really want to get the water all the way down here for all the roots to have access to it. Generally plants need more water in the summer than in spring and the fall because it's hot and plants appreciate getting a big uh, meal of water. So a heavier application of water um, a little less frequently than getting lots of little water snacks. So water in small amounts. So you could water really thoroughly um, one or two days a week and then let it um, drain just a little bit um, in those inter between days. Plants need space. We realize how much space plants need for their leaves because we can see that, but they also need space for their roots. This is a fun fact. Um, plant roots, especially for trees, extend at least as far as the canopy and maybe even further. So you can see here the edge of the, the overhead canopy. So the roots extend at least that far, maybe further, and um, go anywhere from uh, six to nine feet deep. So the root system is often wider than we think it is, um, and we can't see that. Here's a vegetable root system. If you could see it underground, you can see it branches out. And so this is why we need to make sure we give plants space so that they don't end up like these um, potato plants where there's not enough room for either the roots with the potatoes growing on them or the leaves. Instead, this would be better where each plant has enough space. And here's an example with carrots. We have carrots where they're all spread out and each carrot has enough space for itself and then ones that are planted too closely together. Plants need air. This is one of the few things you don't have to bother giving them. They can get air on their own and, and an oversimplification of what plants do through photosynthesis and respiration is that you can imagine plants breathing in carbon dioxide from the air, which they will then use, and then they exhale or release oxygen that's produced during photosynthesis, which is the opposite of what humans do. We breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. So plants get access to air through their leaves and a little bit through their roots. The last thing plants need are nutrients. Nutrients are the food source for plants. There are 17 nutrients that we um, have discovered are essential for plant growth. And they include ones you might be familiar with like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur. Um, if plants don't get enough of these nutrients, they can develop deficiency symptoms. Sometimes you can have situations where they get too much of a nutrient and this causes toxicity. Usually you don't have these problems if you use a balanced fertilizer according to the directions on the label to provide nutrients for plants. So normally you don't have to worry a lot about this. But you do need to keep in mind that these nutrients, which are shown here, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, these are found in the soil and plants will take them up through their roots incorporate them into their leaves and flowers and fruit. And then when you harvest the vegetables or fruits, um, you're then removing some of those nutrients from the garden. And so we need to be uh, conscious about putting those nutrients back through fertilizers 
and other nutrient sources. All right, so we've talked about the five things you need to grow healthy, happy plants. And if you can provide all five of these, um, then you will be very successful in your garden. They are um, water, nutrients, sunlight, air, and space. When to ask for help if you have problems with diseases, insects, nutrient deficiencies, and more. My name is Bethany Walters. I work at the University of Tennessee at Martin, and I'm gonna give you some guidelines for um, when you know you have a problem um, so that you can ask for help. So our goal today is to give you the basics of what you need to know to grow and work in your gardens with children. Um, you will encounter problems with your plants this summer, and that is normal. It just happens to everyone. Um, and we don't expect you to be able to know what the problems are and know how to solve them on your own. But if you can learn how to recognize when you have a problem, then you'll know when you can ask for help. You can reach out to people like me or other people who have experience in gardens, and, and we can come help you figure out what it is you need to do. Um, so let's start by talking about what do healthy plants look like? Healthy plants have dark green leaves. They have whole leaves that aren't torn or have holes. They will be growing and getting bigger, especially as we get into June and July and August. Um, they have uh, luscious foliage that's not wilted like you see down here. So one of your best signs that you have something wrong is when you see um, plants that don't look as healthy um, as uh, you think they should or look different from the ones that are healthy and growing. So now I'm going to show you some common symptoms and things that will let you know you might have a problem with your plants. Keep an eye out on changes in color. This is usually a common symptom. So Maybe you would have you have a plant that started out dark green like this lettuce plant and gradually it started to get lighter um, green or even yellow. This is a common symptom that indicates we need to adjust the plant nutrients. If you see plants that have colored patterns on them like this plant, uh, this is a common symptom that we encounter with plant diseases, but this is not normally the color you see on cucumber leaves. You might see brown or white colors on the leaf. So this um, white color is caused by a fungal disease that's um, infecting this leaf. And so you will see this white color. You may also see like a powdery or hairy um, uh, fungus growing on the leaf. It's a very common symptom of a, a disease. Maybe you see brown areas that start to develop on your leaves. These brown areas will be uh, dry and crinkly. They, they're parts of the leaf that are dying, and so that's an indication of a problem. You might see plants that have wilted and remain wilted even after watering. Now, if you have a plant that starts to look like this, um, that means your plant, it often means your plant needs water. So if you water it really well, and it still looks just as wilted, this is a sign that there is a uh, plant disease or an insect that is affecting this plant. Another symptom is the loss of um, fruit or leaves off of the plant. So if all the leaves start falling off, that's a problem. Um, as long as you know that the, it's not because uh, small hands are pulling off all the leaves, then you, you probably know that you don't have a disease or an insect. Um, but you can have pests like a deer that come in and eat all the leaves off of your plants. So leaves falling off is a bad sign. Um, if fruit starts to fall off the plant before it's mature, that is also a sign of a problem. And this is something you might see in your garden. It's called blossom end rot. It often happens on tomatoes. The um, end of the fruit will start to die and then the whole fruit will fall off. 
And uh, it's a really easy fix. We just need to give the plant some extra nutrients. If you see unusual shapes or patterns on your leaf, this is also a sign of a problem. So here we have all these um, irregular spots that showed up on the leaf. That is in a, a symptom of a bacterial leaf disease. Here we have a leaf with uh, this kind of maze-like pattern um, throughout the leaf. This is an insect that is attacking this leaf. And this specific insect called the leaf miner, and it makes these really distinct patterns. But you recognize, you should recognize right away, even though you are, you don't know a lot about leaf miners, that that's not normal for a leaf. So, if you see insects or insect damage, this is something that uh, can be a problem. So. Maybe you actually see the insects eating the leaves, like these Japanese beetles eating this cabbage leaf. Or uh, you might see small insects like these aphids that are these little mini uh, yellow soft body insects that hang out on the bottom of leaves. When you physically see the insects, it's obvious you have an insect attacking your plant. But you might not see the bugs. You might just see the signs that they leave behind, like uh, this leaf that's been chewed full of holes, or this leaf over here which has discoloration and some holes in it as well. So some of these uh, diseases look really alarming, but I want you to know that almost no plant diseases are dangerous to humans or even to animals. There are a few rare exceptions, but they are not the type of plants that you're going to be growing in your garden and, and your garden is not going to be the environment where that disease is likely to occur. So as alarming as this fungal disease on this cucumber looks and this bacterial disease on this uh, tomato is, you are not going to get powdery mildew or bacterial leaf spot from plants in your garden. Um, now it's definitely a good idea to not eat any plants that um, look like they're infected so I wouldn't recommend that you eat this tomato. Choose one that um, doesn't have any um, obvious damage or blemishes on it. And it's always a good idea to wash your hands when you come in from the garden um, before you go like to lunch for example. Although I know it is hard to resist uh, snacking in the garden but just remember, you are not going to get uh, the disease that your plants have. So we saw some insects that can be problems for plants, but I don't want you to assume that all insects you see in the garden are bad because um, many of them are neutral, like they, they don't really care about your garden, and some of them are beneficial. Examples of beneficial insects include honeybees and other pollinators that are um, important. They come and pollinate the flowers on plants so that they will produce fruits or vegetables that we want to eat. And there are a lot of beneficial insects that are predators and they attack or eat um, plant diseases or insects that are attacking plants. So this is a lacewing and it is eating aphids. Ladybugs are another example of beneficial insects. This ladybug is just going to town and eating that aphid. Ladybugs are voracious consumers of aphids. And this one is one of my favorites. This is the praying mantis and they look really scary um, until you learn that they are beneficial. They will kill other harmful insects and even though they look like they can hurt you, they really can't. And so if you see um, praying mantises or other beneficial insects in your garden, you can point this out to the children you're working with. Like, this is a beneficial insect. He's helping us grow a healthy garden. Let's let him live in this garden with us. All right, so you will probably have a few problems that come up with your plants um, this summer. That's normal. Almost everybody has either a disease or an insect 
um, problem that occurs. So some of the really common diseases that um, might happen are bacterial leaf spot, powdery and downy mildew happen frequently, that's this fungal disease. It's common for there to be problems with inadequate nutrition, so phosphorus deficiency is very common. Um, pH imbalances are also common and they affect both the chemistry that happens in the soil and um, what nutrients are available. It tends to be pretty easy to correct that though. And pest damage is very common. So we've talked about insects, but you also might have slugs and larger pests like deer. So hopefully you now you know some signs that mean there's a problem. And it, it is not your job to diagnose the problem and figure out what to do. Unless you really want to learn more about that and then we'd love to help you. But if you think you have a problem, then please come ask for help. And so you can reach out to uh, me and another UT Martin faculty in the plant soil sciences. Your local extension agent is a fantastic resource. And you can also talk to other people who have experience in gardens and they can also help you out. Now, if you are, um, if you come to me and say you have a question or go to your extension agent and have a question, there's a few, question, um, few things we're gonna ask you to um, figure out what's going on. So we might ask you, what plant type is it? Is it tomato? cucumber? And what parts of the plant are being affected? Is it the leaves, the stem, the fruit, the flower? We'll ask you what symptoms you're seeing and so you can describe them, but also pictures are great. Be able to document what you're seeing, especially if you don't know all the words to describe what you're seeing. We'll ask you when did it start? Uh, maybe uh, it started uh, last week, maybe it's kind of been a slow gradual problem you've observed. And we'll ask you if all the plants are affected, um, if it's just a few, and if so, which ones and where they are. So if, uh, if you can uh, collect all the answers to this question and, and send them to us when you let us know you have a problem, we'll be able to really quickly get back to you. If you have older children who are hanging out with you in the garden, you can also recruit them to help you answer some of these questions and kind of play a plant uh, detective and try to diagnose what's going on. So after you observe a problem, um, you reach out and get some um, advice from an expert. They will then tell you what they think the problem most likely is and some solutions that you can take to address that problem. And so I want to let you know a few of the different avenues that you could go um, along to fix problems. Some things are really easy, like adjusting the fertilizer and soil pH is really easily done. Um, after you do tests and determine what the problem is, you can just uh, add something to the soil to um, fix what is missing. For diseases and insects, it's a little bit more difficult to treat it. Um, not impossible, but here are some of the options you might have. Um, there are some safe chemical treatments that can be used to treat or prevent um, disease or insects on your plants. Now, there are definitely chemicals out there that are uh, not safe to be used around children because they are very powerful, and those are not the chemicals I'm talking about. Um, but there are a few um, safer, gentler chemical options that are available that when used correctly can be very effective and still be safe. So before you put any chemicals out, make sure you get some expert advice to make sure that you are doing it correctly so that you are safe and uh, the children in the garden are safe and anyone who gets to eat the produce is also safe. There are non-chemical treatments as well. Um, this could be something as simple as pruning off the leaves of the plant that are infected to prevent it from spreading. Um, you can Sometimes you can just uh, pull the insects off the plants and squish them so they don't keep attacking your plants. 
Um, there are situations where just kind of hosing the plant off with some water is enough to get rid of some of the diseases or insects. And so there are often non-chemical treatments available as well. So that's one option. You can treat the disease or insect. Another option, if you don't feel it's appropriate to try and treat the disease or insect, is to just remove the infected plant um, and, and re replace it with a, a new plant or a different plant. Or, if the plant disease or insect is, is only causing minimal damage and it's not spreading, um, you can just let the plant continue to grow. It, it won't be as productive as um, it would be if it was per perfectly healthy, but your job is not to grow the most cucumbers, um, and so you can still have a good experience in the garden um, and still get some fruit off of it sometimes, uh, even if they may have a little bit of insect or disease damage. Uh, so, I hope that your garden this summer is healthy, you have no insects, no diseases, slugs don't invade your garden um, but when you d if you do have those problems remember there are people out there to help you so please let us know um, we would love to uh, hear from you and and help you in any way we can Sometimes it can be a little tricky working with little children in the garden. They want to pull out the plants, they want to overwater, they want to dig in the soil. How do you deal with these issues? Well, the first thing whenever you're at the garden, you always ask the children, what is it that plants need to grow? And there's four basic elements, sunlight, soil, water, and space. And you can have them show what that means by pointing to the sun, pointing to the soil, pointing at your water bottles and having them express what space means, so keeping them distant. Let them explore the wonders of nature and get dirty. It's okay to get dirty. Keep a bowl of water ready for rinsing off dirty hands after outside play. If a child pulls out a plant, make it a teaching moment and show them how to plant it again and also make sure to water it afterwards. When planting seeds, give each child a small quantity and direct them where to place their seed. For collective planting, you can count to three, one, two, three, and then plant all together. It's important that the children take ownership, so we have included plant markers, and each of the children can have their own plant marker with their own name, which will encourage them to take care of the plants. Show the children how to harvest the leaves, using both hands, not pulling, but snapping off leaves of the plants. And then for watering, if you could select every day two to three water warriors of the day, and that will entitle them to feel confident in watering so that they can make sure to water the soil, not just the leaves of the plant. So just water the soil, encourage them to do that. And if they use a watering can, show them how to water through the spout and not dump it out through the top. <laughs> Another thing you could do is modify the little teapot song when it comes to watering in the wa with the watering can and how you water it that way. <laughs> My name is Chris Fleming. Uh, I coordinate the, the Ag in the Classroom program for Tennessee. I'm employed by Tennessee Farm Bureau uh, and this work is done through the Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom. The foundation is 30 years old this year. Uh, that's older than some of you looking back at me on the screen. The Ag in the Classroom started about 1982 with the idea that some students really didn't know all the things that the teachers knew. And y'all know that is, as a teacher, you'll use a uh, figure of speech and the students just look at you like, what are you talking about? Uh, we have four interns, five interns working with us here this summer. And I mentioned uh, to one about burning a DVD. And these are college juniors and seniors. And one of them's like, who uses DVDs? Nobody has a DVD. What? You know, and I'm like, you know, I remember eight tracks and cassettes and all those kind of things. So, so as we progress, some things kind of get left behind and some of that is agriculture. Uh, but the important part is that agriculture is what feeds us two, three, four, five times a day. Uh, and without it, we would be uh, hungry. And without uh, some agriculture, we would be 
cold because we wouldn't have the clothing that cotton and wool and some other things provide. And we might be just outside because tree farming provides lumber that provides houses for us and shelter. Uh, so agriculture is very important. And that was noticed uh, that students didn't have that background knowledge like previous generations had back in about 1982. The USDA started asking states, what are you doing about this problem with ag literacy of students not knowing where their food and fiber and clothing comes from? And so they uh, convened a conference and they got all folks from all over the country together. Uh, and so they started the Ag in the Classroom effort. Then about 1990, Tennessee decided, hey, we're doing farm days, we're doing teacher workshops. This costs a lot of money. Uh, is there a way that we can form an organization that can apply for grants, that can uh, give people tax deduction benefits if they donate to us? And that's when the Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom will start. The first resource that I want to share with you is our Instagram page. Uh, one, of our consultants, one of our consultants runs and um, does a wonderful job and she posts daily um, throughout the year. She'll post activities that maybe she's doing in her class or that other teachers across the state have um, tagged her in or sent to her and she'll post those. So that's at um, T-N-A-G underscore classroom and that's on um, Instagram. And then I'm going to attempt to do this, share my screen. Okay, can I still hear me? Okay, so this is the first um, resource. This is the, Ag in the National Ag in the Classroom homepage. They have a wonderful, a, a wonderful resource called the Curriculum Matrix down here at the bottom. On the click curriculum matrix, um, you can search by grade level, you can search by content area. Also on the um, National Ag in the Classroom website, you can get information about the National Ag in the Classroom workshops, events that are happening, agritourism. There are probably um, virtual farms that you can tour with your classes right this very minute, uh, let's see. All right, here's the journey2050.com. Uh, this is, is this the one with, this has the games or is that the Farmers 2050 that has the app, right? So Farmers 2050 is the just game. Journey 2050 is meant specifically for classrooms. It is a game video, uh, game type aspect of it but it also is informational in the process. Okay, so this game, for example, when we when I discussed soil samples earlier, I appreciate, the thing that I appreciate about this game is the graphics are very true to life. When my husband is on um, the planter or, you know, the sprayer, the graphics are very true. So, if, so when he's spraying and putting down fertilizer and things like that, um, I appreciated that, for example, in your field, you might only need just a little bit of nitrogen and a lot of, and a lot of phosphorus and um, things like that. So I appreciated the graphics and what the, the students can actually grow a crop from all over the world and um, harvest their crops. And then they get to make the choice of how to spend their money, how much to put back into their business, how much to put out into the community, how much are they going to spend um, to live and those are real choices that farmers have to make and that is one of the things that I appreciate so much about this game. Also on this game it will have um, you can meet actual farmers in those particular areas all over the world so that's interesting and I think the kids will enjoy that aspect of the game as well. Anything to add on that one? Joanne let me jump in just a minute. Yeah. Agclassroom.org uh, when you were showing the matrix. It does have a feature where they can uh, create a binder and that binder lets them save their lesson plan so they don't have to go hunting for it all the time. And anytime we make updates to those, it'll automatically be updated in their binder. Uh, and all that takes is an email address, I think, that, uh, that goes into that. Hopefully, uh, within the year, we'll have that 
uh, the matrix on our Tennessee Ag in the Classroom webpage and not just on the national, but it'll, it will be the same one. All right, myamericanfarm.org is another um, online resource with games. Again, it has it broken down into a grade level. These games are, oh, and it has apps too. I can't, I can't see that now. Or so for parents and educators, your subjects, themes, that kind of thing. These are games that the kids can play. So if you want to share these resources with your kids, those are K2 games. They have, uh, it appears they have downloads in the app stores as well. So that might be something that you guys could use for your, especially depending on how it's going to go this year. <laughs> it's called a teacher resource guide. Uh, and uh, it just gives you all kinds of materials for pre-K through 12th grade. So some of my favorite activities, um, you know, are the lower grades. And uh, Valerie mentioned the alphabet soup. This is sort of like if, if I had to pick one resource to take with me to do a workshop, uh, it would be this one. Uh, and it was actually designed early on for pre-K kindergarten teachers. And uh, But I've used it for my church group, uh, adult church gr class. Uh, I've used it in Bible school. I've used it. Uh, we've used it all over the country to tell you the truth and people love this and it's free. Uh, dedicated to bees and then the National Honey Board, uh, very uh, helpful and uh, willing to give, uh, donate things uh, as needed uh, to uh, your classroom and they are always a participant in the National Ag in the Classroom Conference and have a really nice uh, booth set up as well as doing some presentations. I think one year they dress up as a bee. So uh, bees are something that go along with gardening. And um, every year uh, when we our gardens start blooming in the spring, the, uh, we have kids on the playground because the gardens are around our playground and we have kids that get stung. And we have teachers that worry because the gardens are causing the bees to come in. And we also have a pollinator garden and we are a monarch butterfly waste station for the city of Knoxville. So yes, bees are a necessary uh, pollinator. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, as well as I do, if you leave them alone, they're not going to sting you uh, unless you sit on them or something. Uh, so uh, it's nice to see that our monarch butterflies and our bees are coming back to the urban Knoxville area. So agclassroom.org, agfoundation.org, um, tnfarmbureau.org is the Tennessee Farm Bureau and our Ag in the Classroom page is a link on there. So Ag in the Classroom is trying to make that connection back to here's where your food comes from. Kids don't know that that's how the food chain works. Uh, they're open to all kinds of uh, misinformation and they'll start making some decisions maybe based on emotion or based on misinformation instead of science and based on facts. And that's our goal, is that you would have the ammunition, the tools you need to say, this is where your food comes from. And when you're wanting to make healthy choices, do that based on science. You know, if, if you need to drink uh, soy milk because you're allergic to cow milk like my sister was, that's perfectly fine. That comes from soybean. Soybean comes from a farmer. Uh, if you need to drink goat milk, which is probably closer to human milk than soybean milk would be, uh, that's an option as well. Uh, let me ask you, uh, this will be a, uh, this will be a drop of an answer in the chat zone here. How old do you think a chicken is when it meets Colonel Sanders and gets turned into nuggets? So if you think you have that, I see 69, that's an old chicken. Uh, six months, eight weeks, three to six months, eight weeks, six months, one year. All right. So a baby chick is, you know, comes out of a fertilized egg. It weighs just a few ounces. Uh, we feed it 
we we keep it protected that's why we keep them in the barn um, we keep the temperature just right we feed them uh, the the appropriate food for the age that they are the amount of protein the amount of carbohydrates the amount of fiber uh, and whoever said uh, six to eight weeks that's the right answer for a broiler We were able to build an outdoor classroom area a couple of years ago at our school. Um, we had a um, school board member who had passed away, had attended my school when he was a student and loved our community and it was for agriculture. So that kind of gave us a jumping point, um, applied for a few other grants. And so we have a decking structure that has enough seating for two classrooms. Um, of course, we're socially distanced and we'll have to spread them out a bit. It also has raised planters and a worm uh, farm. And the worm farm was a part of a composting grant. And so the kids were able to um, take like banana peels and that kind of thing and go dig a hole and, and cover up the banana peel. And the kids, you'd be surprised how many have never touched a worm. And so that's a really cool connection for them. And it gets conversations started and relationships built because we know that if we can reach them on a personal level, we can take them places academically. And so through gardening, I think you're able to make those connections very easily. I can pretty well promise that any lesson that you're going to teach in your classroom, you can tie in agriculture in some way, um, whether it be the literary, literary aspect, whether it is an extension lesson, um, whether you are talking about the plant life cycle. So agriculture is part of everyday life and it's not just one or two times a day. It's not every time you eat, it is every time that we breathe, we are dealing with agriculture. And it's very important, and that goes back to the 9 billion people or more by the year 2050. We have to start making decisions now for our world. And through agriculture, that's what how it's gonna happen. If any moment you can get these kids involved in helping you, they will eat it. And every one of my pre-K and kindergarten students tried it. Um, I was surprised that they were begging for more on some, they were like, mom makes this, but I never want to eat it. So I'll, I'll eat it this year. So that's really interesting to kind of help them experience foods that they haven't had access to or that they never wanted to try before. Greetings from the Weekly County Farm Bureau and Women's Leadership Committee. I'm Terry Brundage. Some time ago, while enjoying a program on early childhood education and the benefits of children having access to great green spaces and seeing things grow, an idea was planted which resulted in a project named Watch It, Water It, Wash It, or www.eatit for short. An Ag in the Classroom mini garden grant provided funding for PVC pipe gardens being hung, planted, and tended on the play enclosures of eight local day child care centers in the county. Following that first season of three and four plantings of 15 different vegetables, fruits, and herbs, armed with a survey showing good reviews and interest for another season, ideas to enlarge the growing areas sprouted. Sam Gorette and the local Food Network representatives took our fledgling project ideas for expansion and their desire to continue the program and Nourishing Connections was born. Nourishing Connections accessed additional mini garden grant funds and with great support from our local farmers co-op added 10 bunk feeders providing greater growing capacity to add new and different vegetables and herbs to the project. Additional sites were again added and the benefits of the project were bountiful. In helping children understand more about their food, where it comes from, how it grows, how it tastes, plus the benefits for children toward better behaviors, building empathy, and showing kindness to others. It is our greatest hope that this program, its training and access to materials, will provide multiple benefits to you, your child care center, your programs, your staff, and most of all, the children for which you provide love and care. Thank you for your participation and our very best wishes for implementation of these ideas and materials.
Upon completing this video, you will see a survey link for each participating Early Child Care Center educator to complete. Once you fill out this short four minute survey, your center will receive a Nourishing Connection Grow Kit. This will be the first of three kits you will receive throughout the growing season. The grow kits include water bottles, harvest of the month program, posters, preschool lessons, so curriculum oriented garden lessons, parent newsletters. You'll also be receiving two books, The Plants We Eat and Farmer's Market, as well as the upcoming 2021 local food guide. In the kit, you will receive plant markers, fertilizer, water bottle caps, which will help aid the children in watering. And there's some suggested tips as to how to encourage the children to water the correct way. And a bunch of different kinds of seeds based off of the surveys you had completed in 2020. Along in the box, we'll also be including recommended planting dates and a ream of paper for y'all to be able to make extra copies and make copies for the parents um, to provide their parent newsletters. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can find my contact information on our website, nwtnlfn.org, or you can reach me by email or telephone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you were able to learn some new tips and information about how to incorporate Ag in the Classroom and gardening curriculum into your daily activities. After you're finished this training, please visit our website, nwtnlfn.org and go to the Nourishing Connection page and on that page you will find a survey link. Upon completing this survey, y'all will be able to uh, be qualified to receive your first grow kit and you will be receiving three of these throughout the growing season. The first one will be distributed in May, the second in July, and the third towards the end of August. Thank you so much for joining us. We realize that these times are very difficult with the pandemic going on, but we wanted to be able to provide you with this training because your work is so important in nourishing the connection that children have with their food, life, and their community. Thank you. The Nourishing Connection program is managed by the Northwest Tennessee Local Food Network, a 501c3 nonprofit organization located in Martin, Tennessee, whose mission is to serve as a catalyst for a thriving and equitable local food system that is accessible to all. We would like to thank our partners, Farm Bureau, Tennessee Foundation Agriculture in the Classroom, Growing Minds Farm to School program, and the University of Tennessee at Martin. You can download program materials and, and the evaluation link at nwtnlfn.org slash nourishing connection. When the training evaluation is complete, your center can start growing and using your first Nourishing Connection Grow Kit. Thank you for joining us today.